in the United States of how this impact looks at the local level. First is El Paso, Texas. Um, <clears throat> the garment industry there, in 1975, El Paso was a town that had, I think, about six, maybe eight, very huge garment plants that belonged to companies like Levi and Lee and Farah and so forth. These plants employed two to 3,000 people in each one. They were unionized. They paid 10 to $15 an hour back then. Then when the garment industry began to open up under the border industrialization program across the Rio Grande in Ciudad Juarez, um, these, this kind of operation was no longer competitive. So what these companies did was basically they broke up their operations. They closed the big plants and they outsourced or subcontracted the work to dozens, scores of tiny sweatshops. And the industry today in El Paso is completely different than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It's composed of about 150 sweatshops. There are two or three semi-large plants left, but most of it is subcontracting work that has to compete with the subcontracting work done across the border for one-tenth of the wage. Um, and it does this by paying minimum wage and no benefits whatsoever. Uh, and the only reason that this industry, uh, actually the, the employment shrank a lot, as you can imagine, under that kind of a situation. Recently they've had a rebirth, this is very typical of border industrialization phenomena between the United States and Mexico, and this is on the U.S. side, remember. Uh, the big boom in employment came because of the popularity of uh, stonewashed jeans. Many of you have stonewashed jeans on, I know. Well, <clears throat> how these are made, huh? <laughs> these are made by using vast amounts of water from the Rio Grande, which is scarce already, an ecological disaster, and putting into that pumice stone and all kinds of toxic chemicals and acids, which the workers work with, but, you know, it's a job. So, all right, they're pouring all this into the Rio Grande River and all the rest of it. And people talk about, well, they don't enforce ecological laws in Mexico, they don't enforce them in Texas. And that's a pretty documented fact. Um, all right, moving along, let's look at Los Angeles for a minute. Um, Los Angeles in the garment industry had a very similar phenomenon take place again, you know, a number of years ago as production began to develop in Tijuana in that case, in both the garment and uh, elect electronics industry, you had a fragmentation in the industry. East Los Angeles, where most of the garment is placed uh, now, is actually worse than El Paso in the sense that things are so subcontracted that vast numbers of the people who work there, mostly people from Central America and Mexico, um, work in not even sweatshops. They work in garage shops or they do homework for below minimum wage on piecework basis. It's uh, barely legal. Some of it is illegal, but it goes on on a massive scale. And to drive through and, and see this and talk to people is pretty, uh, pretty uh, depressing, actually. Uh, so that's one thing that happened there. But there's something else that happened there which will explain a recent event in our history. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, beginning with actually going back to World War II, Los Angeles was an industrial town. Not just little sweatshops, either. Uh, it had a lot of big places like the Pico Rivera uh, Ford plant. Uh, GM Van Nuys plant, which only recently announced it was going to close forever, permanently, goodbye, uh, and several others. When this kind of, when the auto industry and these kind of industries began to shift investment in the late 70s, which is when this began specifically, that industry was closed down almost overnight in, uh, in Los Angeles. Between 1978 and 82, uh, a mere 10 plants closed, costing 75,000 blue-collar jobs. Almost all of those blue-collar jobs were held by people who lived in South Central LA. Does that ring a bell? Another 100,000 manufacturing jobs were lost through similar processes later, you know, in, in the 1980s, and then boom, explosion, okay. Now there's Detroit, my hometown, or at least where I've been living for what seems like forever. Um, the same process, uh, it's, it's more complicated and it isn't just related to Mexico, but it is very heavily related to Mexico. 
25 plants closed since the late 70s, basically. Only two new plants opened in Detroit in this whole period. Um, in northern Mexico, however, outside of the Maquiladora program, forget that for a minute, six new state-of-the-art assembly and engine plants were opened in this period, all of which their production is geared towards uh, the United States market. I mean, that's, that's the major thing to be said about all of this industrialization that's taking place in northern Mexico is that 80 to 90 percent of it is directed towards the U.S. market. Mexico is too poor and getting poorer to have a sizable market. It does have a sizable middle class, but that remains a limited phenomena in economic terms. And so, for example, automobile production doubled in the last few years in Mexico, but domestic consumption of automobiles remained at the 1981 level, and all of the new production in Mexico was for export, mostly to the United States. Um, all right, so we have here, in a certain sense, what I'm trying to get at. If you look at this process in geographic-specific ways, what you have is a kind of bipolar process, uh, a process of industrialization at one end and a process of deindustrialization at another end. But what's remarkable about this process uh, is that the end result of the process at both ends is disturbingly similar. And what I mean by that is basically the phenomena of the impoverishation of the inner cities in the United States and the rise of a phenomena in northern Mexico that is familiar anywhere in the third world where this kind of industrialization takes place. And that is basically the, the, the situation of modern plants, state-of-the-art plants, facing shanty towns, basically. You can see this anywhere from Soweto, South Africa, Sao Paulo, Brazil, <coughs> to Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. Uh, not all of the Ciudad Juarez is a shanty town, but most of the growth of it is. Is, is. As these workers are coming off the land, being displaced, they're moving into these areas in search of jobs. Sometimes they're coming into the United States, but they're looking for work in Mexico as well. And <coughs> There has been a growth in jobs in these areas, enough to attract people, but not nearly enough to employ them all. And where are they going to live? Developers in Ciudad Juarez or Tijuana don't go out and develop housing uh, for these workers. They go out and develop industrial parks where there is money to be made. And so you have huge, vast, expanding residential areas for workers that are basically without any urban services or infrastructure. They're without regular electricity, without regular running water, um, without roads, without sidewalks, without street lights, uh, and most important in, in these cases, without sewage. And you can look at Soweto and these places that have been like this for three to four decades, and you can say, well, isn't the history that, you know, you go from being a shanty to being a cinder block house, and then the next thing is, you know, you get this, well, if you have money and if your wages go up, that may happen, but that isn't what's happening now. Uh, we can see that after three or four decades in some of the places in Latin America and Africa where this has been going on, there is no change. The most you can aspire, aspire to under these kinds of situations, you know, is basically a uh, cinder block house. And that's, that's pretty much the kind of industrialization that is going on and that is going to be encouraged by the North American Free Trade Agreement. I would just say that, uh, having recently been down there, um, the visual nature of this uh, effect is, is amazing. Um, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez can see each other across the river, which isn't the case with all the border towns, but in this case you can actually see Ciudad Juarez, like all border towns in the United States, is predominantly Mexican and way below average in income in the United States. And yet, the, the difference between the two cities on the one side and the other side is like night and day. The degree of poverty you know, in Ciudad Juarez compared to the degree of poverty in, uh, in El Paso. And part of the reason has to do with the nature of the border. That is, we have created what is basically a militarized yet porous border. Militarized. Uh, I see people say, what, what are you talking about? Yeah, again, if you haven't seen it, it's hard to realize. 
you go down to the U.S. the side of the border where um, people come in from Mexico, and it's like all lit up, and it's like a fortress, and it's got INS guards and all kinds of guards there carrying, you know, arms and all this stuff. Um, the border is patrolled in these big Broncos and down there even on horseback and all of that. Uh, and people are killed. I heard a figure that in the San Diego, Tijuana border area, more people have been killed uh, <clears throat> in the last, I think, uh, 20 years there than were killed altogether in the Berlin Wall. Pretty shocking figure. Uh, so the phenomena there is to keep wages low in Mexico, on the one hand, by making it illegal to enter the United States without a green card and limiting the number of green cards. And on the other hand, those who get into the United States without documentation to keep them terrorized so that they won't complain about working at minimum wage or less. Uh, and this kind of situation, you know, I think is one of the reasons why development is very difficult beyond the industrial aspect of it in northern Mexico. There is no market spillover in the classical sense. People's wages are not coming up on the other side of the border. They're being held down by the government, by complicit trade unions, and by the American corporations who are in there sitting on top of this whole process. Uh, I just want to conclude by saying that I think when you begin to understand the North American Free Trade Agreement in this sense as a shift of investment, a change of the industrial map, one that has very specific ramifications in specific geographic places, in, certainly in the United States and, uh, and Mexico, and I think by implication in Canada as well, uh, you begin to see that uh, Professor Galbraith was off the mark when he said this will not have any impact on our two nations. I think it will. And furthermore, looking at what's going on in the border area, um, in you know, the U.S.-Mexican border area, what I see there, and what I think if you read the history of almost any third world nation or continent, uh, what I see going on there is the making of a gigantic explosion. This is the mirror image of Los Angeles over there. And Los Angeles is the mirror image of it. And there are strikes in these plants, and there are land seizures in the cities, because that's the only way people can get a place to live. Uh, and there's conflict of this sort, and it all seems to be building up. When you take a place like Ciudad Juarez that had 600,000 people 10 years ago, and you today have over a million people living there with no infrastructure, you're heading for an enormous social explosion. So I think that, indeed, in our lifetime, in the next several years, that once the North American Free Trade Agreement encodes these processes in international law and kind of writes it in stone in a certain sense, even if it didn't create the process, uh, that we will be looking forward to an era of pretty serious economic dislocation. Thanks. I guess we're going to take comments and questions for a few minutes here. Yeah. To what degree are the changes that you've been describing that have been occurring for a decade or more been driven by changes in technology and automation and uh, that type of thing? Well, I think technology plays an important role in all of this. Uh, I mean, I didn't go into it, but it does in a number of ways. Um, First of all, it makes the decentralization of this process practical in a way that maybe it wasn't 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I, I did mention about telecommunications. I can't overemphasize how important that kind of technology is in the new production systems. These plants that may be thousands of miles apart are linked electronically. And in what they call synchronous ma manufacturing and some of the latest developments of these systems, and just-in-time inventory, even though you're talking about thousands of miles of geography and terrain between them, you know, they can be electronically setting inventory levels, production levels in other plants and so forth. So I think, yeah, it does. And the, the other side of it is because we are in an era of rather breathtaking, mind-boggling technological change, um, one of the things that happens is that as new investment replaces old, 
It employs a lot fewer people, not a few fewer, a lot fewer. GM is going to replace, I didn't even go into the GM example, but, you know, probably many of you know they announced this year, you know, closing 21 plants. Uh, 87, it was they're going to close 11. Um, well, in, in the 1980s, they built 31 plants in Mexico. So, you know, there's a very definite shift here. Um, one of the plants that they're going to build in the next two or three years will replace an old plant in Mexico City. It will employ exactly the same number of workers and will produce twice the number of cars. So that's the impact of technology. You know, the, you get more profit for the buck, more production for the buck, but you don't get more employment. Well, I think the most, I think, to be perfectly honest, I don't think we can stop the change. And it's, you know, I think we can modify certain things about it. Um, and I think there is a different way to do it, but we don't control the governmental processes that would, you know, allow that to happen. And it's more than just the question of labor rights and environment rights. But what I think American workers need to do, and some of them are beginning to do, is to change their whole mind frame about what their labor movement is about. If we get the idea that we can circle the wagons in this kind of an internationalized economy and simply say, to hell with everybody else, then we're going to lose totally. The whole ability to get some kind of industrial stability in North America uh, rests on a strategy of what I would call upward harmonization. Harmonization is a term they use in trade economics and just means making everything more or less the same. Well, in most wages, this kind of free trade situation um, that the NAFTA is, is going to encode tends to lead towards a downward harmonization of incomes and wages, at least of workers. Um, <clears throat> and so I think what the American labor movement needs to do is to begin to work with the Mexican labor movement to create links both at the grassroots, not just at the top levels. You know, theoretically, they already do that. And I'm not talking about Lane Kirkland sitting down with uh, Fidel Velasquez, you know, who is not going to do anything. It's neither of them. Uh, but to begin to build these kinds of links at the grassroots, rank and file level, uh, and at industrial level. Some of this is going on. There was a meeting that I was involved in, in organizing um, last fall, a year ago, uh, in Mexico City, a tri-national auto workers meeting where representatives of local unions from Canada, the United States, and Mexico all met. Um, not all the local unions, obviously, but, you know, some of them. There were about 20 people from each country. And they began to set up links within their companies to, in the first place, trade information, which was not as trivial as it may sound. In the case of the Mexican workers, they're working in plants that are using toxics uh, that have been banned in the United States and Canada and you know, are brought in in unlabeled barrels. I mean, they have no idea what they're working with. So the Americans and Canadians agreed to get them the information on these toxics and so forth. And they have, in fact, done that. And there has been some, for the first time ever, uh, some bargaining by the Mexican unions. And this was the official CTM union. And, you know, the government-dominated union actually went and did this. So some of this stuff makes a difference. I mentioned the telephone workers. We also helped to organize uh, a Canadian and U.S. telephone workers to go to Mexico as they were installing this new kind of operator equipment that I was talking about uh, to explain, to talk with the Mexican workers about how they had responded to this, not just in technological or technical terms, but how this affected workplace organization, the union, and all of those kind of complex shop floor questions. And that was a, a big success. So I think these things can be done. There can be these exchanges and these links built uh, so that in the long run, and it is the long run, let's not kid ourselves, it's not going to happen overnight, but in the long run, the raising of the incomes of Mexican workers, you know, has got so we can get to the point where we have, for the workers, a level playing field. So bring them up to our standards instead of us bringing our prices 
Yeah. Right. You got it. <laughs> I deeply really share your concerns and worries, but um, what is it? What kind of solution do you have in mind? That to me seems like what you just suggested as one of the solutions. But uh, with that solution, the problem is that uh, with systematic and consistent high unemployment rate, uh, it is really hard to have a cooperation. Even within Asia, it is hard. And in international terms, it is really hard. And uh, how can you uh, to pursue such a goal under a systematic uh, high unemployment rate? Well, you're right. It's very difficult. I mean, I think the answer ultimately lies in the sort of proposal that has come out of Mexico primarily from uh, Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas and some other opposition leaders in Mexico. Uh, and what they're saying is they don't want the North American Free Trade Agreement as it is written. But they recognize, as I think almost everybody does, that you need trade in the world, right? I mean, you know, we're not isolationists. Uh, so <clears throat> trade is a reality. The question is, who's going to control it? You know, I read a figure that 40% of world trade is now intra-firm trade. That is to say, multinational corporations rec regulate 40% of world trade. That's absolutely astounding if it's true. Um, and even if it's much less than that, it's still pretty astounding. So they're regulating world trade. There are other ways to regulate it as well. Uh, so what, what Cardenas is proposing is that we have a trinational or perhaps hemispheric or regional uh, development pact. This is a different idea. Instead of just letting Mexico's agriculture go to hell so that you get these 10 to 15 million people flooding the cities looking for jobs and creating the unemployment you're talking about, all of which was done by virtue of policy. This wasn't some act of nature. Let's have a different policy about agriculture in Mexico, one that allows them to return to a level of self-sufficiency they once had. I was joking earlier about Iowa corn, but Mexico, of course, <laughs> corn was their like major uh, agricultural product. But somewhere in the 1980s, they had to begin importing corn because of the destruction of the old agricultural system. It's irrational. It's not that corn is cheaper when it's imported from the United States. That's nonsense. It's more expensive. So, <clears throat> you know, having a development pact that allows for different paces of growth in the different countries, that allows for attention to different kind of sectors like agriculture and so on, uh, in a way that creates some kind of upward motion for the long run, you know, and that, that could be internationally negotiated. Personally, I do not believe that the current governments of the three nations are going to do anything of the sort. Uh, that's just, you know, utopian. Uh, I think it's even very unlikely that, I wouldn't name them, but, you know, if some other candidate won in the United States, that he would do much in that direction either. Uh, but <clears throat> there are alternatives, certainly in Mexico and in Canada, the alternative political parties have this as part of their program the New Democrats in Canada and the Party of the Democratic Revolution in Mexico. So, they need some friends here. <laughs> I've been told that the last 100, 150 years of uh, industrial revolution or development, on balance, created more jobs than were lost as things changed. Do you have any feelings about the next 100 years as we move into uh, the information age uh, revolution, whether the same benevolent situation will exist or whether we've got major problems on our hand in uh, decreasing numbers of jobs? Absolutely. I think if we don't get to the notion where in, in this country and any other country that we have to begin doing, this is just a minimum. I mean, there's a zillion things you need to do to keep there from being mass unemployment. But I think steps could be taken, and it would make a big difference, by the way, in North America if this were part of a trilateral agreement. And what I'm talking about here is the shortening of the work week. That is, you can't go on working people 48 to 60 hours a week. In the United States, we work on average, according to one study, a month 
the equivalent of a month more each year than we did in the late 60s. Imagine that. You know, that's ridiculous. And we have all this technology that's putting people out of work, and everybody's doing overtime. The UAW, the United Auto Workers, estimated that if they had just eliminated overtime in the year 1988, they would have created 85,000 jobs. In other words, all the jobs that were lost to Mexico in that period could have been salvaged. I mean, you know, it gets a little complicated. But more or less, uh, you, you, could, you could do that kind of thing. They've begun to do that in Europe, and in Germany in particular, where they will have 35-hour standard week in 1995. I don't think they're moving fast enough. But I think if we did that in the three countries here, in industry in Mexico, it's a 48-hour week. In the Maquila plants, it's longer. Uh, here, we're working 48 well, average of 43 hours, but in a lot of industries, much more than that. And we're in a recession. It doesn't make any sense. So one solution to the problem is to kind of link the, to think of it this way, to begin to link the amount of time people work to increases in productivity. So that as productivity rises because of technology, the amount of work time goes down. Now, of course, the, the, contentious element in here will be what happens to wages, right? Are they going to go down with the hours, or are they going to go up with the productivity? Well, you know, business has one idea, and I have another, but, you know. Uh, but I think that that is one of the things that we have to move towards on a world scale. And when you talk about it on a world scale, even eliminating three or four hours on a world scale would create so many jobs, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Corporations don't like this because they say, whoa, it won't make us competitive. We're doing all this stuff, this technology, this industry, this internationalized lean production to get competitive, not to give you guys a good time. Uh, you know, so there'll be an objection to it. But uh, it seems to me that that's what we have to push for as a minimum. Wouldn't the population control Yeah. Yeah, I think that's harder, and I'm more nervous about it because it often involves state coercion and, you know, things like that. I'm not saying that, I'm certainly not against birth control and things of that sort, uh, but there have been, there's a kind of side to that which I, makes me nervous, I have to admit. Uh, but yeah, sure, that, that would make a difference. But again, I think controlling the work, regulating production through regulating hours, you know, is more important, really, and more doable in the short run. You are saying that uh, okay, rather than giving overtime and just give a limit on the working for work hours per week and the rest of the hours given to uh, others, so in that way it will increase the employment rate. But if the people are working overtime, as it has been uh, suggested by some others, by uh, <coughs> some economists and some provisions, if they have worked overtime to make the lost income, if that is the case, then limiting the weekly working hours will put the employed people in the living under the may, may not be a standard of living, but uh, minimum standard of living, but at least the debt will lower their wage and which will affect their um, income and uh, their life and so on. So, uh, how well, I, I do believe that you, as you shorten the work time, you do have to raise the hourly rate. I mean, to compensate for this, for what you're talking about. That if you don't do that, you will get a backlash to it, you know, and, and so on. Um, it seems that we've kind of gone over our time. I just want to thank you all for coming.